meet you. And uh, this is the dissertation defense in the space psychology by Elizabeth Tiklinski and Dr. Carrie Bofield uh, from the space psychology core faculty, and myself, Bama Shirazi, I'm an adjunct faculty and chair of this committee. And uh, we have Matthias Cornelison, at least some um, hope to connect to him. He is uh, uh, a long time, maybe four years, uh, practitioner of integral yoga and psychology lives in the Pondicherry area where Sheridan Ashram is. And uh, we we're very happy to have him because of his expertise. And uh, so we hope to uh, do this within the next hour and 45 minutes now since we're losing more time. And typically what we do is 45 minutes of maximum presentation or maybe, maybe shorter if possible. And then, uh, then the committee gets a chance to ask some questions, and we'll see if we can get advice or not, but at least Carol and I might have some questions, comments, feedback. Then we open it up to you folks on the other side, and if you have any questions or comments, we can do that. And then uh, comes a minute where we have to make some decisions about the outcome of the defense, and at that point, we'll let you know what happens, depending on what kind of contact we have with Matthias, but we're prepared for that anyway. So we'll figure it out once we get there, whether he's available at the moment or not. That's another thing. But um, So that's pretty much the way that this is set up. And thank you so much, Elizabeth. She just flew over from Michigan last night and uh, left her family, little kids, everybody. <laughs> done a marvelous job with this dissertation, as far as I can see, but of course we'll hear it from your point of view. So maybe you can just start us with um, your version of what you've done, and uh, and then we'll take it up from there. Okay. Oh, can I present? You can present. Okay. Yeah. Um, the name of my dissertation is A Matter of Heart and Soul Towards an Integral Psychology Framework for Post-Conventional Development. And every picture, that's why I've been up all night long, every night, I'm trying to find the right picture for every little thing, but you probably go through it very quickly. So um, I can go back to any slide if you find something like, you know, interesting or you have questions or anything, but I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. So uh, this is the sunlit, sunlit path, and the obstacle is the way. Oh, there's someone who looks interested. Hi. Just a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from University of Michigan in 1998. I began my graduate studies in 2002. It took me seven years to graduate with my master's in counseling. And I did my internship at hospice. And I had some profound experiences there. And um, it really inspired me. I, right after I was done, I was on the phone with Anna. She was the chair of the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. I said, let me in, I want to do my PhD in transpersonal psychology. And uh, I started right away, transferred in as a year three student. So that's in 2009, and I thought that I had come home. I was surrounded by people who think like me, and spiritual and psychological, and started devouring all things transpersonal. And I really got into, I admit it, I really got into the Wolverian literatures, and I I got into some <coughs> with friends about that, but um, just put that up there. So this is a uh, my original cohort. God bless them, all the doctors. <laughs> they graduated. I would have graduated in 2011, but it wasn't the case. I'm there, Marianne Williamson. I would go to her. Um, 
She was the spiritual director down in Warren, Michigan. Okay. Just push the green button. Oh. And push the. Um... Oh, can you see me?
Bauman's class on human development, and right at the very end, he said you should look at some writings on Shirovindo, and I did look at a couple of things, and I'm like, this guy's right on. I, I, I like him, and that, that was about it. And so, um, so just I came across this quote, and it seemed to really sum up what had happened to me. Um, you know, the Hindu idea of dukkha, the idea of false perception creates pain. And um, I felt that um, my wrong, false perceptions were um, part of the problem. And this dissertation is, for me, the, the true perception that um, by giving expression to it, by you know working day and night, seven days a week, 14 hours a day, for five years straight. I mean, I haven't had a weekend, I haven't had a vacation. I don't have friends, I don't have a mother anymore, I don't have anybody. They've all left. I don't have any time for anybody. Um, so this is me on the day that I had my healing. And um, I took this, or I, had, I kept this picture because of the beautiful light, because I felt like the light was healing. Um, and so after that experience, it wasn't you know, I was healed like the next day or anything. It was a process of, come, you know, correcting my false perceptions and um, replacing them with uh, correct perceptions. And so I would begin, and I didn't even know about the mother. I didn't know that, I didn't know the whole story. I just, it just came down like a download and it was completely unfamiliar to me. But I would start having dreams about her and I had a class with Anna, an ethics class, and I would tell you about it. I'd have these dreams about her, and I would get uh, directions and things like that. So um, I felt like an ontological misfit at the uh, Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. Um, mm -hmm. I felt like uh, so Alex Rachel. Oh, I didn't keep the first picture. Misfit twice. <laughs> I was a misfit, and they found my island of misfit toys here. It's like CIS. But anyways, um, Alex Rachel, who I was, um, Jorge Fair, told me you need to read his dissertation, and it was very good. <clears throat> but he said um, that he began to notice the extraordinary degree to which a larger community of transpersonal scholars and traditional practitioners had internalized the biases of perennialism, monistic me metaphysics, and mystical orientations that focus on realities disclosed in unitive states of consciousness within that global source. What struck me most about these encounters with my fellow practitioners was the sense of encountering a group think that was at one highly charged, yet somehow vitiated, and one hand superficially tolerant, yet on the other hand subtly intolerant. I did not feel like when I was talking about the soul or the psychic being that um, I was taken seriously by anyone other than Bauman and Anna. Um, so, um, so the doctoral journey has been my own sadhana. Uh, so I saw a quote in the beginning of all this that set a big uh, goal so big that you cannot achieve it until you grow into the person who can. And um, I feel like at every single realization, every single sentence that I put into that dissertation over there, it was a hard one journey. Like I would have like something experiential, like a test, even to the point where I don't want to say that my friend died as a test from the universe, but one of my closest friends just died a couple of months ago. And um, it, it just felt like, but there was a huge realization on the other side of the grief that I experienced. But, um, so it was my own night sea journey. And my deepest aspiration, you know, I would love for other psychologists to suddenly start thinking about the immortal soul as being part of the evolutionary journey of what we call human development, but I doubt that's going to happen. So um, my aspiration for this work is that it can be contributed to the greater will of the divine. And you know, if it can inspire someone else's progress, someone else going through a dark night journey, you know, start having these experiences with non-physical gurus and everything, and you want people to say that you're not crazy. I, I hope I can inspire you. Okay, significance of the study. 
So um, since Maslow, you know, um, many people have, many psychologists and theorists have suggested that these higher levels of development that Maslow talked about are not only critical for individual development, but also for uh, societies in large. And um, when I talk about post-conventional consciousness, it's, uh, it comes from Lawrence Kohlberg. He's the first person to term it. But it basically refers to uh, the stages of development that are beyond uh, Piaget's formal operations. And um, people who talk about uh, post-conventional consciousness, they talk about larger ethical concerns, maturity, moral integrity, constructive generativity, generativity social responsibility, and individual agency and autonomy. Maharishi said that all other um, aspects of development are, it forms a basis for all other forms of development. Post-conventional development research, um, you know, despite a, a seeming vast range of higher development, uh, all the studies that come out say that basically, well, based on, you know, their mechanistic, you know, tests, pencil and paper. But it's estimated about 2.5% of the um, adult population ever reaches the stage of being characterized beyond formal operations. Mm. And so on a practical level, a um, few studies have explored why development appears to plateau so relatively early in an adult life, what exactly facilitates post-formal, post-conventional development, why higher development remains such a rare occurrence, and what could be done to change that. And uh, I like this quote from uh, Michael Daniels. He talked about perhaps one of the reasons why we don't have more uh, post-conventional development in society is because we don't we're lacking the conceptual language to describe it or even to create you know offer it as a goal. I mean, if you look at Facebook these days, I don't think I see that as something that people aspire towards. Um, but, you know, in the six decades since uh, Maslow, uh, no real uh, integrating framework has come about. And uh, even though Wilbur has an epistemological map, spectrum of consciousness theory, he even admits that um, most uh, developmental theorists are at a relative loss of actually describing <coughs> what the uh, facilitation factor is, what it is that that mechanism of change, what and if we knew that what that was, then maybe we could help facilitate uh, transformation towards those higher levels. Um, and then Matthias had a great quote uh, a few years ago when I shared that with him. And he said, it looks to me what is harmful is the presence of bad maps, like the materialist one. Distorted maps are very much amongst us. And as the world gets more and more educated, they do more and more harm as the only way to get rid of bad maps is to replace them with better ones. Develop, developing these are um, crucial. So um, I had some fun creating some maps. And so, um, you know, the famous pronouncement map, the map is not the territory, but uh, one of my favorite online coaches likes to say, yeah, but, you know, a framework, a reliable framework is helpful when it comes to figuring out where the saber-toothed tigers might be located. And for Jung, where the Leviathan might be hiding out. And, uh, you know, Jorge Ferrer has written some really nice and interesting um, writings on this potential pitfalls on the spiritual path that lead to spiritual narcissism and integrated harassment. Um, sometimes people who call themselves spiritual are really looking for spiritual highs, spiritual peak experiences. Um, but what they're actually after is the antithesis of what an authentic spiritual path and what it strives for. So I like that image of the fool. The problem with bad maps, I like this too. A fiction a writer, McCarthy, Similarly, echo the dichotomy of false versus true maps. A bad map is worse than no map at all, for engenders in the traveler a false confidence that might 
easily cause him to set aside those instincts which would otherwise guide him if he would but place himself in their care. So like ancient ships that would navigate uncharted oceans, a bad map could put you in a very precarious position. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, Asagioli, uh, Jung, any of the spiral dynamic type theorists have said that po this post-conventional training, even though we don't know what it is, it seems to be uh, much more difficult and nuanced. Um, there's dangers that lurk somehow, you know, when you go beyond identification with the mind and ego. In fact, even um, Jung would say that a person could risk madness or a narcissistic self identification, uh, midlife breakdown, inner disturbance. Um, he said the risk of madness is always a risk uh, when uh, going in these uncharted areas. Oh, all my maps. Um, dangers are well uh, chronic, uh, chronicled uh, historically, like the temptation of St. Anthony, the confessions of St. Augustine. Buddha said that he was uh, attacked by the negative demon energies of Mara. Um, so I, I guess I had, I removed all my good and bad maps trying to send this to Matthias, but I had like the color wheel and the zodiac and um, the flat earth, you know, with the ships floating off the end of it. Um, and so I had some good and bad maps, but they didn't. Brief historical overview. So the word psychology, as we all know, comes from the Greek word psyche and logos. Psyche in this context means soul, logos in this context means study. Because the word psychology literally means the study of the soul. So um, in a similar way, the word uh, therapist originally comes from the word servant or attendant. Etymologically, a ther psychotherapist is then a servant or attendant of the soul. Mm -hmm. Even uh, the word psychopathology uh, refers to the soul. It comes from the Greek word psyche and pathos, literally meaning suffering of the soul. I think that's what I have Modern psychology chose to cut itself off from the roots, however, and graft itself onto the tree of the physical sciences, um, focusing on the science of behavior. And, um, Alpha's the same as a major mistake. I spent a lot of time trying to make it look like I grafted a tree. <laughs> 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 and so beginning with Newton's most uh, famous influential work, uh, the ghost was taken out of the machine and the soul was removed from matter. In evolution of the universe was ignorantly reduced to reliable, self-sufficient clockwork. Leaving no meaning or purpose for a soul. So the soul becomes self. Look at these graphics. Can you see these? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, soul becomes self. Increasingly, for over 300 years, the conception of the soul has faced a series of further pragmatic and philosophical setbacks. And so, um, for the like the past century or so, uh, many psychologists have been looking at this self and trying to describe the growth processes and evolution, specifically Piaget, Colbert, Lavinger. And they've termed this uh, growth process human development. Especially over the past 40 years, uh, they've charted over 100 diverse maps of human development. And when they are looked at, when specifically you know, Piaget or post Piaget, uh, theories are again for patterns of congruence and dissimilarity. Uh, psychologists seem to agree on conventional development. They, it, according to you know Western centric, but you know a lot of um, studies have been done in Aboriginal and other than Western cultures, and they still seem to suggest that at least the first several uh, you know stages up to formal operations are invariant and they seem to go along and even um, when they break things down to cognitive, social, moral, and ego related lines of development they see the same trajectory from pre-rational, pre-conventional to 
pre-personal uh, characterizations to increasingly complex, rational, conventional, and personal stages in adult development. All very predictable. So formal operations as an endpoint is basically the West's ideal of autonomous, rational self. Thought of, you know, it's easy to think of it as the highest achievement of development. Piaget says you're done, you know, you're an adolescent, you're, 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 you're all done. Um, because what could be greater or better than being a rational, <laughs> autonomous self? Um, and he found that it was paradigmatic as well. And so Jorge Bear has noted that um, beyond the formal operations uh, endpoint, that you know people who call themselves transpersonal, integral, post-conventional, post-formal, they don't seem to agree very much. But they tend to go into two diver divergent paths. The first is the structural hierarchical path, and this is the Wilbur you know, people who consider development to be like a ladder that. You know, you hit your rational stage and you just, there's just going to be more stages above and beyond. And the other is the spiral dynamic path, not to be confused with Beck and Cohen's brief zoom, spiral dynamic, TM, it's not that. Um, but Washburn, Michael Washburn, he uh, talks about once you hit the formal operational uh, characterization of identification, you, um, you hit like a crisis, a spiritual crisis along the lines of Frost, which is fine. Um, and then, you spiral back down to what he called the ground of all being, the, the deep psyche, the, the depth that's basically the impersonal source of all consciousness and being. And then you come back, like you know, the phoenix rising, you come back with you know, the hero you know, to return to your home, transformed and transcend. Um, so there's lots of controversy in schism in the, um, the debates. Karn has called it a civil war of sorts. Um, Ferris says these divergences are not merely about minor theoretical issues, but often about the central philosophical and metaphysical foundations of the field. For example, the understanding of transpersonal phenomena, the meaning of spirituality, the very nature of reality, is something that Wilbur has called a Gordian knot, has existed for at least three decades. So what exactly is transpersonal consciousness? Uh, Cook Bruder says that development in its deepest meaning refers to transformations of consciousness, but depending on who you ask, everybody has a different answer to that question. Um, but suffice to say that transformation of consciousness is prolific in the extent literatures. Um, looking at the developmental maps that I looked at, I have about 65 pages of references. I have thousands of pages of um, notes on roughly 100 different developmental theories. And from what I've looked at, it seems that most make the assumption of adaptation, which is the idea that um, events in your life, in your outer life, will correspond with something happening in your brain that will trigger some type of an event that make you have a different perspective on life. So. Um, So it's an assumption of autopoietic structures. So, um, so the triggering agent or event is outer, the uh, or you know the most inner that is accepted as the uh, basic structures of the brain and the mind. And it's assumed that the structures themselves generate the stage change. So that it you know Wilbur has talked about the pre-trans um, fallacy. Basically, before your personal self and after your personal self, he says both are impersonal. There's no you. There's just these structures you know, swapping out. So this is my depiction of the spiral and the, the ladder. <laughs> so uh, this debate basically comes down to personal plus versus personal minus. If you have formal operations, are you going to go back down to the, you know, go back down the ladder to the ground? Or are you going to start building up all these superstructures, you know, scaffolding above, on top of the formal operational mind, the autonomous, logical, 
you know, mind and just keep on building up to transpersonal characterizations of consciousness. And then it's the spiral dynamic folks say, you go back to the ground and the structural hierarchy will say, no, we we'll keep on building new, better structures on top of the brain. Uh, there are intimations of an authentic self. Cook Bruder has noted that there is often a breakdown and there is a great deal of discussion about what, what it is that this authentic self seems to be, especially when we look at self-actualization. You know, if you're actualizing, who is that person? Is that, it, and it doesn't seem to be formal operational. So the question is, does it come about at the same time as formal operational thought? Does, it, it seems to come about, though, in the transition beyond formal operations into the post-conventional spectrum. But they, um, there's no real agreement on what that is. So it's basically 21st century now, 100 years after the establishment of the American Psychological Association, and there's hardly an agreement in the you know, literatures. There's hardly any agreement in transpersonal psychology. I see, everybody at CIS seems nice, though. <laughs> I don't see any big borders going on. So here's my uh, um, Tower of Babel. And I wanted to notice that it, to me, looks like crumbling scaffolding to heaven. And so, um, just real briefly, the way I came at the literature is to um, assume that there are invisible metaphysical biases in everything. And just like a fish that can't perceive that it's swimming in water, every theory has its own biases, assumptions about, you know, if, if we are coming from, you know, structures in the brain and, you know, fluids and chemicals or something transcendent. Some people think that, you know, we just, we're nothing but a representation of one unit of spirit and there is no multiplicity or, you know, transmigration of the soul. Everybody comes from, you know, their own perspective and it's, it shows in the theories. Bias is swimming in metaphysical water. And um, it seemed to me that because all these theories, they don't really talk about the soul dimension. You can tell me when I need to stop. Uh, they, um, and I said there were like four reasons basically for this positivism, the Cartesian and Kantian legacy, and the limits of formal operation logic, and transpersonal scientism which basically comes down to transpersonalists are trying so hard to be deemed scientific that they, they often shirk from anything that seems occult-like or you know, something that would not be. So I'm just gonna go through this. So um, I came from the perspective that a theory comes first. A lot of the qualitative methods I felt were, they were not, I was not allowed to do a theory at IPP. I want to do a theory. I was told I need to do 12 interviews with people and I come up with my theory after I get into the field and do my work. I think that the theory comes first because there's no such thing as tabula rosa. There's no theorist out there who's just, you know, coming into his blind. Um, to a theoretical framework is to see, you know, through someone else's eyes, the, their own, how they perceive reality. There's no such thing as a theoretical research. And, you know, I, I go into conceptual frameworks as lens, map, and myth. It, Daniel said that all developmental theories are mythic in a way. Not saying that they're false, like uh, Craig Chalquist here says that in America especially, we have this funny tendency to think that anything that is mythical is a lie or a falsehood, but he says it come, often comes much closer to the truth of reality of a you know culture of an individual. And postmodernism basically um, has defined itself as incredibly through meta narrative. So um, basically, they focus on these small, non-attached stories, but um, and frameworks, but they're empty. And I say that. Perhaps uh, these empty frameworks are 
the result of an empty psychology. So how do you go, how do you include the soul? Brant Cartwright says that Western psychology is lacking an integrated framework. So I am going to skip ahead to the work I've been doing. So I did, I did problemization where I uh, documented all of the theories and their perspectives and then I took, I did an alternative uh, assumption ground which is integral to yoga psychology and I had them, di the literatures basically dialogue with each other and it's supposed to lead to more interesting theories. So that's my critical review of the literatures. Based on uh, Bauman's uh, 1994 uh, model, he, I thought this was really great, he said that, you know, if you look at these theories of the self, they tend to go into three categories. The egocentric, which in integral psychology terminology would be the mental, vital, and physical. The cosmocentric, which is, you know, pure awakening to only ultimate reality, and that in all else is illusion. And the psychocentric, which is where the soul, the dimension of the soul is alive. And so I go and I really go through all the literatures and show which theories are egocentric, which and they, their roots are Cartesian. Um, it's like an organic machine is what the human being is of. Um, and then epiphenomenalism is the main main uh, you know orientation of their reality that, that everything is coming from a, a brain structure. And one of the people who uh, is a real modern day spokesperson of this is thanks to Matthias. He really caught me on to this guy, uh, Tufts uh, professor Daniel Dennett, leading spokesperson. And he basically says, You are nothing but your neurons, and the patterns by which your neurons are essentially connected. Quote, the mind, everything that makes up you, your thoughts, feelings, dreams, desires, uh, uh, rises entirely from the brain's physical activity. There are no ethereal spirits or an immortal soul. Just the what matter between our ears. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear laughter. That's, that's what this guy looks like. I, I prefer Shreya Bindu. <laughs> so, a summary of egocentric concerns basically materialism, trying to, you know, the scientific nature, and then the cosmocentric sphere. Um, Ken Wilber. Ken Wilber, a, a lot of these theories of what I say later on here is that they're basically, they take the egocentric and they take the cosmocentric and they create a stat, you know, and they take it and make it into tears. And uh, so a, a thought amongst the uh, transpersonalists or the cosmocentric people is that there is no true self, there's no enduring ontological referring point that's actually making the transition. It's all like a flickering picture show. There's just pictures and they're moving so fast, that it creates the illusion of, so he, when you talk like that, you're not even talking about transformation, you're talking about there's no one there, so who's transforming? I'm sure everyone went into that in some beautiful ways. He says, you know, who's the walker taking the steps? Philosophical underpinnings, I thought it was fascinating. I have to read my dissertation because I can't get into it all, but the Kantian, um, just the, the belief that we must be, the ontological reference point must be the physical body, it must be the mind, because, you know, the numeral is unknowable. It's here in history of it. Everything appears to be in the body or by the body, and either for the body or for the eye seems in the body. The body seems to be the principal, if not the only cause or determinant of individual consciousness. What is not of the body is the physical field outside the body, whatever in consciousness seems not to be of the physical field, yet appears to be derived from it, be the result of development or the formation from physical experience. So they're, they're all missing all these theories. I may have missed some, but I doubt that anyone's out there saying that there's an immortal soul like the psychic being that is evolutionary, it survives death, it is um, from a different, it, you know, exists in several different planes of consciousness. Um, but this, this is something I can't, is that what you're just trying to go? Oh, yeah. 
two denials. They basically just mirror each other, the egocentric and the cosmocentric. And when you stack them up on top of each other, you're not solving the problem of describing who or what is actually transforming. So you're forced to talk about transverse, uh, transcendence versus transformation. Uh, there's just a mere swapping of basic structures. That's my missing person picture. Mm -hmm. So personhood is absent from all these theories. And so the second <coughs> dimension is missing. The evolutionary soul dimension is missing. Uh, so I go into how the soul is not intellectually fashionable. Here's uh, that's how you feel if you want to do an academic study <laughs> of something occult. <laughs> and there's a refusal by academic psychology to even consider it in the occult realm. And the interesting thing is, I quote some interesting things, like the, the non-dual stuff is not threatening for some reason, but you start talking about something occult and you are But, however, and this is all despite the fact that there's tons of, you know, scientific, well, you know, rigorous studies looking into, I have in my references, I document all this different uh, types of research, suggest, highly suggestive of something along the lines of reincarnation, um, like hip, uh, not there. so that's the image of the transmigrating soul, but as, you know, as um, insistent as the field is on its framework, there's still a subtle unease that they're just not explanatory. They're not, there's not a whole lot that they can explain, especially about transformation, especially about meaning of life, why things happen as they do, you know, these types of non-physical encounters that one might have. So there's new emergent territory, this is psychocentric, and this is the alternative assumption ground of the integral yoga. So, um, Sriravata said you have to know the whole before you know the part. There's very briefly the vertical planes of being. And he was very, it's very interesting how there are vertical planes of being and there's horizontal planes of being and they're all interacting with each other. Bhagavan says very holographically in, in very complex ways. But uh, so you have behind your mental, behind your vital, behind your physical, you have what Sriravata said behind the heart. Um, in a secret cave is the psychic being that's no bigger than the size of a thumb. And so I go into the horizontal concentric realms of being. So on the outermost, so you have your outer, your cognitive, your affective, your behavioral, and the inner being is the mind, the heart, the subtle body, and the innermost being is the, uh, are the true selves or the purusha, and then behind that is the psychic being. That's your true, according to integral yoga psychology, that is your true reference point. That is your the thread that stays consistent. Oh, okay. <coughs> it is the optic ref reference. And uh, the mother talked about how the psychic being existed in the fourth dimension. And uh, we discovered that there are many paths beyond the mind. I'll go back to this real quick. You could go straight to nirvana. You could spiral back down to the lower nature. You, you know, it's not invariant after you know formal operations. You can keep. That's what Sri talked about in the human cycle. Um, and if one chooses, one can choose the integral path. I just want to get to Saturn's uh, quote here because it's so relevant. So I don't know about nirvana. around the lower nature because the lower nature is already established because there's involution and there's evolution at the same time there's it, so the, the physical realm is already involved so it's uh, there's patterns already set up so as the human being evolves you know it, 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 there are some structures that are already present so that it does explain the conventional pre-personal personal transpersonal kind of seeming the really interesting thing is that Sri Aurobindo talked about beyond the mind, there are mental superstructures, and um, they can even be spiritualized, and they're up and off the the um, 
the rational, but they're in the opposite direction of the true self. That's a, you know, if you think of an axis going, you know, outward, you have a true self inward, and it's going in the wrong direction. It is not enough to describe Sri Aurobindo's discovery. We must also understand how it is accessible to us. It is very difficult to draw a diagram, however, and say, here is the way. Because spiritual development is always adapted to the nature of each individual. So the soul. That's a shiny red thread. Okay, and for good reason. This is not about learning a foreign language, but about oneself, and the two natures are alike. The ideal I put before, this is quoting, the ideal I put before our yoga does not bind all spiritual life and endeavor. Spiritual life is not a thing that can be formulated into a rigid definition or bound by a fixed mental rule. It is a vast field of evolution, an immense kingdom potentially larger than the other kingdoms below it with a hundred provinces, a thousand types, stages, forms, past variations of the spiritual ideal, degrees of spiritual advancement. Therefore, we can give only a few pointers with the hope that each person will find a particular clue that will open his or her own path. One should always keep in mind that the true system of yoga is to capture the thread of one's own consciousness. Oh my God, I just said. Um, and the, the, the shining red thread of one's own consciousness and follow it to the end. <laughs> 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 You've done well, I think, you know, the 45 minutes, but I want to give you five more minutes, okay. right? Yes. Uh, so that we're looking at you and not something else. And just say, you know, what you learned from this. And if you can also address the research questions that you had. And basically, if I had to walk away right now and somebody said, what was going on in that meeting? If I can say, you know, five minutes worth of this is what I got from it. Um, can you maybe summarize in that way, and then we'll go to questions. Okay, yeah. So beyond the rational mind, you can do the integral path. But um, part of the integral path is a process of purification, and it looks a lot like destruction. And it's and uh, the um, human cycle is called the anarchic consciousness. It, so it, it in, in some places, the psychic being is described as destructive. So it can like sweep clean, talk about sweep, sweeping clean, all the things that are not pure, not right, all the wrong perceptions one has. And then from there, you uh, you can become, you, you're trying to bring down in embodied life a transformation. It's not enough just to have a peak experience. It's not enough just to have a super structure of the mind, you know, that it's all spiritual. And Mother warned of the uh, spiritual ego right after you get rid of your ego. There's a spiritual ego, and most people don't want to get rid of that because it's the most insidious of all the egos. And so, um, so you really are living moment by moment in your own spirit, your own soul's path. Can you say those words? So, Papa? Swapapa? And that's your own, your own path of your own soul, and um, so you, it's not that you're not trying to get off world. You're trying to live your life, your own spiritual path, the way that it unfolds for you. So there isn't a universal, you know, you know gold medal that you get. Out of this. Um, you get a transformation. The goal is that. Um, Shreyavindra's work on the highest planes and to bring down these higher planes and to transmute the falsehood, the ignorance that is the cause of what we consider to be evil and in, with the transformation of consciousness, things like death, suffering, you know, the parts of life that are necessary at a certain stage in the game but can be transformed into what we call the life divine. So talking about like wash burn, spiral dynamic, you know, going back down the ladder, we already established that it's not, it's not a bunch of superstructures are off the mind. It's like a ladder, like a transpersonal or integral will be kind of thing. So is it the ground that's transforming? So is it going back down to the ground of all being? 
Aurobindo Aigu, you would say no, because you know you don't look at the lotus to understand the mysteries of the lotus. You don't look at the mud. You have to understand that there are two, and there's two orders of evolution. Evolution, and the, the, the things that are more um, invisible have more um, explanatory power of what is causing the development to occur. So uh, I basically say that it's Sri Aurobindo's framework would be neither a structural hierarchical nor a spiral um, because those are lacking or firm. They, they all categorically deny anything other than an ego as the central abiding reference point. But Washburn did get into the hero's journey of transformation. And uh, you know, after um, Campbell and all these other mythologies, He's noticed this uh, spiral dynamic in the literatures. And I think that if you take into account a mythology, a personal myth, personal unfolding of your own unique nature, your own soul nature, that that would be like a hero's journey, a transformation where you're, there's a destruction process, there's meeting with the wise person who saves you <laughs> and lights the way and you come out a transformed person. But that has a reference point, that has a hero, that has, you know, a, a, an it's not just a structure. So, um. Okay. Should we get the guys a chance to ask questions sure. before we lose him? Is he still there? He's here. Matthias? I can't hear him. Here we go. Put the, take the mute on. Okay. Mute on. Well, we, we may not, uh, do you hear me? No, what? No, he sees me, but he does it. His, oh, you might need to turn his But he can't. Our sign is yes. Our yeah. sign is Our sign is on. Oh, we know it's in. Okay. Yeah, now, okay, great. Looks like we survived this this thing. There, there was constant support for it. So, but before we lose it, why don't you go ahead and have, have any comments or questions, and then uh, we'll do the uh, inside work here after that. Yeah. Uh, I do have some comments, uh, more than a question actually. I'm very, very much impressed by your demonstration. And um, I think I should uh, revise my evaluation also. Uh, the reason is that uh, my perspective is very different because I come from the land of Sri Aurobindo. That's where I live. Right. So for me, the best things that you have said and found are part of Sri Aurobindo's work already. Yeah. So it looks to me that there is no new discovery here. But that's my area. Because in the relatively small country of California or USA, this is new stuff. Yes. So you're like long back the like Columbus who find America. Yeah? Yes. Which is not great for people who live in America. But very great for people in Europe. Yeah. Right. And I'm very much impressed by the um, physical integrity and the solidness by which in which you are in this battle mm -hmm. to get this higher vision into mainstream psychology. Mm -hmm. Which is at the moment a world civilization. So you are doing a very heroic job. Thank you. And I'm very deeply Oh wow! Uh, but now I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's very serious. No, I. So uh, that's my view of it from the other show. Oh well, thank you so much. Should I should I tell everybody how I came to find you? I don't know. <laughs> I thought I told you one time when I thought that you would. I was uh, battling with ITP and I said, I want to study Sri Aurobindo. They said, no. I said, I want to study Sri Aurobindo. They said, no. Finally, after, I don't know, two different chairs, finally they said, oh, fine, you can, but, okay, who's going to be on your committee? And I just happened to be looking at like a page and I saw your name on it and I heard your name like in my ear and I said, Matthias, come on. Um, <laughs> I think we can do that. <laughs> and then Bob was like, oh, I know him. And I'm like, I had zero. And then I looked you up on YouTube, and I started crying, like weeping. And I started having dreams about you. But it was, I, I said 
your name before I even knew who you were. And now I know that it was for a very important reason because no other person could have taken your place. You, you have, I've learned so much from you, so much. And I so appreciate you. And I can't wait to meet you in person in a couple months from now. I'm coming back to, in uh, June to see him in the person. So I can cover your face with kisses and hugs like we did Bob and Renee. It's so very sweet when you have just passing something on from somebody. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, um, Matthias, looks like you're leaving the challenging questions to us here in the room, then. <laughs> He's already asked me enough. <laughs> He's challenging me. He was, he was saying, uh, I don't know what American defenses are like, <laughs> and I give him a history of what they used to be. Like. But anyway, thank you, Matthias, very much for all your help from my end of it, because it's been a great um, pair of eyes, you know, with the background that, that, that Matthias and this has done. 40 years of integral yoga has been in the, you know, he's started a whole school in, in Delhi, Mirambika School. He has uh, been in the archives of Sharabindo, involved with many publications. He started uh, integral psychology conferences. He, uh, out of that came Indian psychology conferences and movements. He started the Indian Psychology Institute. He's teaching Indian psychology back to Indian students uh, as opposed to Western psychology. He is so um, precious and a good friend, and I hope to see you soon, Matthias. But let me just open it up to the to the uh, chair, I mean, to the uh, committee members, uh, myself the chair. He is the chair, really. Um, uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll ask some questions and then the audience here, and if you do think of anything, please uh, you know, come in. Looks like we hear you pretty well. So Carol, as a committee member, please. Do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, uh, let me say a few things about that. I, first of all, Elizabeth, I thought the, the the lit review and the amount of material that you so painstakingly covered was huge, almost encyclopedic, amazing um, task. Let me start with some, I would say this is a criticism, it's a wonder. Um, what I see is the you have presented many, many different, let's see how you say this in your, in your abstract. You say the guiding purpose of this dissertation then has been to advance the fields of both Western and integral yoga psychologies. So these Western psychologies and the integral yoga psychologies, you have done an incredible job of presenting. But what I, what I feel is, you are presenting all of these, and then you are presenting what Aurobindo said as the answer, or however you want to say that. I'm not saying that as criticism, I'm just no. saying. I, I see what you're pointing But his name's not here. Oh. Okay. Like, it's not, it's not in the abstract, and it's not on the title, mm -hmm. you know? And actually, everything that you have to say is Aurobindo. For the mother, Andrew. Um, yeah, I put them together, Sean. Yeah. Aurobindo and the mother. And and I, I can see the importance of that, and I can see the importance of contrasting it and comparing it to all of these other psychologies. But it's not just, I mean, integral yoga is a very broad term. And what we're talking about is what the integral yoga of Aurobindo and the mother. And so I. I'm sensitive to that. I, I know, for instance, Jung, everything that, so many things that Jung has done and in, uh, been the founder of have been basically stolen without any credit by so many of the Western psychologies, just taking credit for it, never giving back to the person. And I, I feel also in myself as my areas of Advaita Vedanta, I see the same thing where there's this incredible work that has been done, that has a tradition, that has a history, is really uh, contributing to the knowledge base, but is never credited. It's just swallowed. Right. You know, right. even a Sajioli yeah. goes right back to Advaita Vedanta. You know, right. and I think that, say from my perspective, even Aurobindo is very rooted in Advaita Vedanta. 
which, I mean, he himself talks about that. He has gone on and done different things uh, from Advaita Vedanta, but he's rooted in Advaita Vedanta. And, and yet, there's a quote here on page 194. Okay. It says, I'm just going to read you this, because I love his quote. It's a very profound quote. You love the quote too, and that's why you put it in. So he says, do you say more precisely, Sri Aurobindo stated, the infinite does not create, it manifests what is in itself, in its own essence of reality. It is itself that essence of all reality, and all realities are powers of that one reality. Okay. That is Vedanta. Mm -hmm. okay. It ought to be noted, however, that Sri Aurobindo's integral cosmology differs in principal ways, for instance, from one illusionist Advaita that assumes phenomenal reality is just an illusion or bad dream. That's a misunderstanding of Vedanta. I would really um, get into a discussion about that with you. And Buddhist nihilism that assumes the ground of existence is to be an impartial or a negative void. Shunyata is not a void. It's emptiness. Very big difference, huge difference. And for that matter, any form of pure um, nominalism. So I have some feelings that, though I think your dissertation is actually brilliant, and I could never pull all these things together myself. I also have that criticism that you have to be really careful. And just to put you in good company, I, I have the same criticism of Wilbur. Because I don't want to be in his company. <laughs> okay, good. But I, I'm critical of Wilbur because I feel that Wil Wilbur is so, his mind is so vast that he finds himself becoming an expert in areas where he has no expertise right. and people who have depth in the area he's quoting just want to pull their hair out, basically. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? And there he is. He's well known and he's considered an, an authority. And so in these areas, I think it's very, very difficult. The wider the scope, the more ignorance is going to be found in, in there. I don't know how to avoid it, you know, but it's, 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 it's a pitfall that we all have to have a lot of humility. I was going to say, it falls off the edges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it requires a lot of humility. Um, there's a famous, I don't, I don't remember this quote in Sanskrit, but it's a, it's a very famous quote in Sanskrit. You might know. It, it goes in English, something like this. Beware of the wise man because he tends to think he's wise in areas where he's not. It's a very beautiful quote. I never forget this quote. You know, you have, in my opinion, you have a tremendous amount of uh, love and study and depth. For the or, work or of Sri Aurobindo and, and, and the mother. And I have, oh. not, and I have not focused on any, I, I haven't had time. <laughs> well, mean, you couldn't have had time. You, yeah. you, well, I have to be like you, just walking encyclopedic mind. But what I'm saying is your, your thing is so broad that you have to be very humble and very careful. I think that the dissertation is very well written. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very, very happy with it. I'm just telling you. Oh no, my, very, my very good. And that's why I put quotes around that because yeah. I had like this weird intrinsic feeling that maybe I w was definitely in an area where I can't personally speak. That's why I put well, I, I think you might consider putting something uh, in the introduction, just bringing in that little piece of humility, because the breadth of your work is so vast, mm -hmm. there's no way that you can have mastery in, in all no, those no, things. No, of course not. Right. But, but I'll tell you what, um, this is another criticism I have of academics. Of course, I'm an academic, but I have a criticism of it, and that is that um, our students take the books that we write and the textbooks that we give them as though they're the truth. And they are not, especially when you go, when you go into, whether you go into Jung, which is so vast, 
or you go into uh, any of the Eastern traditions, most of them are written in Pali or Sanskrit or whatever, you know, and take years to really understand. West is very hard for a Westerner to really understand those traditions because they're so culturally bound and they're written in Sanskrit. It's very, very difficult. And then we think we know something. And honestly, we know very little. Very little. And there's so much misinterpretation out there. So that's my critique that I'd like you to talk a little bit about, mm -hmm. but at the same time realizing that I think you did an incredible job. Well, thank you. And I, I do not pretend to be an expert on getting even through it. I, it's, it's, it's like 24 hours ago, I'm still learning from the highest and I'm, I'm going to really miss having you to have, you know, all these deep conversations because it is just me and my own little world and my own little spiritual path. And it was, in my ontological reality, my own perception, I felt that this was um, not payback, that's the wrong word, but I felt like I was doing, I, I treated this as, um, as fulfilling my end of the bargain, or my, my gift, you know, like you can use my physical body, you know, I have, I, I, it's a win-win situation, I need a dissertation, you need to, you know, supposedly within 50 years of, um, about 50 years ago, they uh, said that integral yoga psychology of Shuramando and the mother would become, start to become more prevalent in the West. And so I would like to hope to contribute towards that. <laughs> but I'm not an expert. I just worked really, really hard. You did work really hard. Mm -hmm. And you're an excellent writer also. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank Amazing. You. Well, thank you, Carol. Um, um, I, I just um, I just want to say that um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, I'm not trying to just celebrate too quickly here, but to say that um, it's, you know it's great to have a student who can just do the research and do the writing, and then all I have to do is just cut out these three chapters. We don't need them <laughs> because you know she just writes, you know, and she can produce so much. Uh, but I think. What we really came down to here was, um, besides her journey into yoga and, and what that might be, um, that we have a dissertation to produce here. You know, that we have um, a field of Western developmental psychology that has some issues, and I myself, just teaching the class that she took seven, seven times over, I just started to realize that so many students are so many. Uh, there's so many confusions about these things, and nobody's really happy. Nobody was getting much out of all these books that they were given. And this is supposed to be about all these things that we're supposed to grow into, right? So anyway, um, I slowly brought in the concept of, wait a minute, there's also the soul, you know, and our past life has something to do with who we are, and, and this is totally off the picture. So you bring that in, you know, this is a great contribution. I agree with Matthias, and I just maybe, you know, someone else, uh, you know, maybe uh, that this is more of a contribution to Western developmental psychology. It's the fusion of integral and transpersonal psychology. So, you know, there's that. Um, and um, um, there will be, and this is the beginning of a developmental psychological dimension of integral psychology that we haven't had before. So this is, you know, that right. also. So so it's it, it does justice to both. But certainly the majority of the solutions have already come from the work that was shared in the in the Indian traditions. Um, I I agree very much with um, Carol on many of your points basically and um, um, I feel that um, um, your intellectual aspect of this was something that you brought into it, but she was very much guided by something throughout this whole process, so I could kind of see, see that happening. Well, no, it was, it was definitely um, something beyond you know, us individuals, but, um, but I think you know there was something that had to be said about this topic that you laid out the foundation. Now you can continue writing on this, and there will be many other things perhaps in the future. Um, <clears throat> I do agree with, with Carol. One of the things that um, some of us who study Shara Bindo, Liliana, everybody in the room pretty much, I think, 
You know, we all know that Sri never diverted from the Indian traditions. In fact, the only thing that he clarified is that um, there's a um, um, there's a purpose to life, and and that this reality that is easy to take. Uh, you know, there's a confusion in some spiritual discourses where the illusoriness, which is a truth in reality, and the transitory, uh, transient nature of life has been equated to denial of the material plane. That is a fundamental problem. So that causes a problem of embodiment. Why are we embodied beings, right? So the whole quest for a spiritual practice becomes liberation, you know, from pain, suffering, Buddhism, or from existence altogether. That becomes a solution that's been taught. I've never thought that that's a true solution. I think that itself is a perpetuation of aspects of teachings that some disciples never understood and just wrote about, right? Like you say, they yeah. just keep writing about all these mm -hmm. things. There's an ultimate purpose to be here, and that becomes very clear to me. But of course, you know, I studied Buddhism and practiced Theravada Buddhism for many, many years, you know, and as an aspirant of Nirvana, I saw in myself how I was trying to commit spiritual suicide, you know, by getting to Nirvana, you know. And then all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, what am I trying to evade here, you know? And I knew that we have to be here. So I really understand that. But at the same time, you know, when you flip a page and say, uh, we all know about Nirvana, <laughs> you know, and go like that, that's going to put Buddhists on fire. Right, because yes, <laughs> they will, you know, they have so much to say about what that is and what that is and, and so on. But uh, I agree with you again, like we need clarification and we need higher teachings and hopefully through this mess we'll eventually have some things emerging. For example, shunyata, you know, shunyata, according to the best of my understanding, is nothing but withdrawal from all perception. It's a systematic withdrawal from all perception. So it's a state of consciousness without the input of perception at all levels. So it looks like a blank, and some people have thought it's the ultimate reality and written about it and wrote it off. But many have gone beyond that and seen many other dimensions beyond that. So I think, you know, we have a lot of misunderstanding translation and it's a big mess and no one can really fix this but I think um, to bring the soul to the picture um, and to understand the nature of our um, evolving consciousness in the course of um, human development is really a missing dimension that um, Elizabeth's you know, bringing in. Mm -hmm. This was not something that I thought of at all um, when I came up with the three cosmocentric, egocentric, that was my dissertation. I put them in a Venn diagram or something, and I said, and this is not a developmental thing, because I could not think of any way that these are developmentally related. But you are doing that, you know, connecting it to the literature and really doing the critique. So that's an upset. Um, I think I've given you a lot of feedback along the way. I don't think we should take the time here. We have only another half an hour. Um, but I, I would just say that I appreciate your willingness to take feedback, um, a certain non-defensiveness, um, the ability to replace one quote with another, and just be able to grow and be appreciative in the whole process. I've learned a lot from you, and uh, I look forward to more of that as well. So um, I think what we could afford to do at this point is to have um, maybe a few minutes of you know, we have a really esteemed audience here, and if you would like to make some comments or questions, we'll take about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a quick decision-making process to go through, and then that'll be it. So, um, please go ahead if you have any questions, comments. Well, I just have a, I have a quick comment, this will be short. Um, you said by our beloved Sri Aurobindo, peace upon him, that who is the walker taking the steps? And um, I feel through this dissertation, I see the walker. Because of your early experience of what happened to you when Sri yeah, Aurobindo came walk. to you. That's right. <laughs> and it was about your leg. Yeah. And, oh, uh, wow, wow. And that was a literal uh, dimension of yeah. All my lessons have integration been very that was very powerful. And I want to acknowledge that oh, in, you. your, in, in your work. There is also something that uh, was very touching to me about the lotus and the mud. Mm -hmm. And I feel that as we 
look at the integralism of this great work that we all are, uh, that many of us have studied, um, what I see in your work is the attempt, the great attempt, to assimilate that through your dedication of research and the valuable expansion of the Western uh, uh, psychological impressions that um, have predicated over these ideas, or, or at least lived with these ideas that were far in advance of Western psychology. And I just want to honor that, and I, uh, I, I take that as a, a wonderful reason for doing a dissertation. It sets up a focus for your path and, and your life's work, and it's, it's incredibly honorable. Thank you. Thank you. And you reminded me of something I wanted to say. I think it's in the Gospel of St. Thomas, um, that which is within you. If you don't give birth to it, or if you don't bring it forth, it will destroy you. But if, um, if you bring it forth, it will save you, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's how this dissertation has been. Um, I, I don't know if I really made it clear that um, I was supposed to graduate in 2011, I was accumulating credits, I was accumulating student debt, and there was no hope for me to go forward because I wanted to do a theoretical dissertation on sure, but no developmental, but I wanted to do this, exactly what I just did, and there was no way forward, and I had all these credits, and um, and I was, I actually, it was an intuition, just stay the course and just do this um, where I was, um, I basically just um, took a book, started on page one of my computer, and I would just dictate. And to the point where it would just kind of, through osmosis, start to come in. And I, I was practically not even verbal at the time. I couldn't even write. I couldn't even put together a few sentences. So it's a great, you know, to say that I'm a good writer after where I came from. So um, anyways, the, um, I'm trying to say, what was I to say? Um, oh, the, the fact that I, I was just nowhere. I was done with this database, and I was about ready to send it into my then chair, who I didn't really think was going to let me do what I wanted to do anyway. So I, and uh, they, they announced that ITP was, gonna, it was in they dire straits. They had uh, just fired the president. Students were picketing and everything. And I immediately went to some people who work here, Jorge was one of them, Anna was one of them, I said, get me out, get me to CIS, please. And they were like, we take eight credit hours, you know, and I had 125. And uh, Craig, he says, okay, send me over all of your uh, syllabuses that you ever had. I, s I scanned them all in, I sent them all over to him. And he talked to the dean and uh, came back and said, well, accept all of them. And you, you have to take a Jung class because they didn't teach that in transpersonal psychology for some reason. <laughs> uh, and I uh, took that with uh, Craig and we did the Kundalini yoga of uh, and it was awesome. But, um, and I took a class with Jorge, which was very beneficial. But just the fact that I'm here right now and was able to do this and was able to walk the path, and I mean, it was walking in the dark for most of the time, thinking that I would never arrive anywhere. So I'm just so. Grateful to have been here. So, and this is my story on that. A few comments here. I think, uh, you, you know, I, I thought so. I was very impressed with your work. I, oh, thank you. And, uh, browsed through it, didn't have enough time to read it all. But yeah. I think I caught some really juicy parts. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'd like to raise a few questions and sort of comments for all of us from the viewpoint of future studies in this direction, because I think it raises a lot of uh, possibilities. Uh, and I think a, a lot of place for uh, finessing and refinement sure. uh, in terms of development as well as integral yoga yeah. psychology. Uh, or one question is, or one issue is that, uh, you know, we're keeping on talking about the psychic being as Sri Aurobindo's. Right, absolutely. Uh, right. And you, you actually touch on it a little bit. You problematize it a little bit. But, uh, you know, I see, and I, I see that you have my book there. The psychic being was not mentioned by Sri Aurobindo in his early work at all. No, it came from 
It's only after the mother comes into the picture that psychic being and the idea of the triple transformation as a developmental goal or model uh, starts emerging. It's a different, I'd say that I've, uh, that's the talk you were talking about last uh, founder symposium. I think there are significant overlaps and kind of, uh, you know, sort of, um, I mean, identities between the different models that he's presented. But uh, the person, which is, I think, the real point that you're making, who is it that walks, who is it that develops in developmental yes. psychology? Yes. You know, an ontological center of the person, uh, I think that point is made much more clearly by him later on, right. with, particularly with the coming of the mother. Yes. Uh, so I even begin thinking, you, you, you're, you're talking about how the Indian, and I think you do a marvelous job with that, because you've raised that question, is it really there in the Indian tradition? Mm -hmm. uh, the Indian tradition is much more impersonal, and you may call it cosmopersonal, you know, the gods who are cosmic beings, etc. Uh, is it personal to that extent? And so the Atman, and then, you know, I mean, you don't make that distinction necessarily here. The Gita talks about the Antaratman, the inner Atman. And you could say that the Antaratman is an aspect of the psychic being, but it's still not the psychic being. You know, there's something missing there, I feel at least. And so I think there is something to be said about looking more carefully at the origins of these things. And as far as the psychic being is concerned, I'd say that it, th there's more to be said in looking at the Western traditions. Yes. Yes. Say, the idea of the Christ within, for yes. example, the inner Christ, the mystical Christianity, right. or other types of uh, traditions that highlight the person you know, as a developmental source, an right. ontological source. Right. So that's one thing that I wanted to point out. And the other one has to do with uh, what is development. So you, you can talk about the psychic being as the, uh, you know, the, the ontological in, inner person, right. inner Morse person, as you pointed out. But, uh, you know, a kind of a, again, to talk about an impersonal goal as well as a cosmopersonal goal are also forms of development. Okay. And when you talk about wrong maps, the question is, oh, we don't have any map to start with. So what is a wrong map? I mean, one can go only by one's own intuitions of, of what a map is and kind of finesse the map, uh, the model of darshan and yoga as going together is that somebody gives you a map because they've experienced something. And then you use the map as a practical epistemology. It's not an absolute epistemology. So the question is, uh, is integral you know, is there a kind of an absolute epistemology to in terms of yoga? Uh, I'd say, you know, one has to, be, I think at one place you mentioned the psychic being as being another dimension. Well, that's one thing that I came to your work. You were talking about the sphere and the dimension behind the fourth dimension. The, the, that's the, the way you described it in that interview is exactly how it is. Right. So now there are other dimensions as yeah. well, like the kind of, uh, let's say the impersonal, yes. that's another dimension. Yes. So I think the integral is something which acknowledges these other dimensions as, as uh, independent dimensions and tries to find a vanishing point beyond those which is not available to us right now. No. So in integral epistemology uh, is, can only be a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a, a goal that is beyond our scope at this point and we can move towards it. Uh, given that, I think uh, to posit a personal center is very important, and that's really the a great value that oh, I see. Thank you very much. Wow, so impressive. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think something that she didn't really get into is something that we briefly mentioned in some of the conversations yeah. before is that the complexity of the idea of soul is really also important. It, it, it emerged eventually. I think by the 1930s and so on, you know, there was this understanding that um, there's a polarity to the soul that um, along with cosmic differentiation, there's also soul differentiation. One aspect goes into the earth. The other aspect stays, 
transcendent, and that they're both involved in the process. And Aurobindo talks about spiritual transformation through that, yeah. or psychic transformation through this, but the fact that this one is crucial for outer transformation. Yeah. You can do spiritual transformation, yeah. but it may not be effective in outer transformation. If you plan to be here as a future species, yeah. then that will be helpful in the development of the new race down the road. Right. Because, um, you know, uh, we probably have the psychic um, essential qualities evolved up to a certain point, right. still not connected to the higher, right. higher development. They're not embodied yet. But how they will be embodied, I think nobody knows because right. it hasn't happened and may not happen, you know, or may happen, but will probably happen. But it's just that the map that's laid out, I think, frees up, you know, we had a conversation, you know, that we basically kind of let the picture be a little freer, you know, mm -hmm. rather than trying to create a cosmic integral map of what might happen. Just to say, you know, look, you're an adult, uh, past post-formal development, and you can you can have your nirvana if you want, or you can go to the superstructures right. like Wilbur does, you know, you <laughs> can go to whatever plane, you can just be happy with a good heart and just be a humble practitioner and uh, just be happy with that, you know, you don't need to like attain something too cosmic. So I think these are all, you know, post-conventional development and all options are, are totally fine because humans are free, you mm -hmm. know. And so I think it came through with your window quotation at the end that this is yeah, that that was a great quotation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so many different possibilities. Yeah. Who's to say there's no imperative, you know, so it's just, you know, whoever wants to choose. So thank you, Devashish. You know, I know that these points will, will be future publications for us, maybe things to think yes. about. So any other comments? Um, uh, I, I was watching that I was watching that internet last night and I went on to some uh, black holes collapsing, you know, some of these visuals and, and at a certain point I couldn't tell the difference what was animation and what was actually the telescope, the Hubble telescope and I started to see the way these spirals were unfolding and they, they were actually pictures that they took, you know, with this Hubble telescope and then I thought, well, it's not animation, it's, you know, it's real and then the animation, you know, you couldn't tell the difference. But the shapes and the movements in three dimensions in here, you know, maybe five, six dimensions, because they were showing a black hole kind of collapsing into itself and energy shooting out from it. I mean, real, you know, camera video stuff that they froze infrared. It was pretty amazing. So I thought these are the shapes and movements of what is being described in words, and, and it helped me because I'm a map maker. I make, I love making maps like this. And uh, so the artistic world really helped, you know, me to understand, you know, where are we at located when we're watching this three-dimensional object it's swirling and changing form, you know, who's the witness there? And it's really pretty amazing. I think a lot of, a lot of the the, uh, the information that helps me comes from, you know, really looking at some of the, uh, the, the real images and the imaginal ones that come off of that because, you know, it's it's pretty pretty correlating to what. Read in a lot of the transpersonal development models. And uh, I just want to share that. Thank you. It seemed like you got into the arts. Yes, that's what my next thing I'm going to shut down my computer and do nothing so but paint for a while. Any questions? Anybody else? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was really. saving process for you and I know um, from what I, I haven't studied Sri Arvindo the mother for a long time but I remember reading about how a lot of his med meditations were kind of geared towards changing his own cellular structure is that, oh, yeah. is that right and so I'm just wondering about the applications of you know bridging not only Eastern and Western psychology but kind of bringing that into the medical he healing field and how Sure. Um, profound this type of work could be in that context. Yeah. I don't want to sound I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or anything, but uh, since this process it wasn't only my leg I healed. I don't get colds. I, I mean I mean I don't the only time I got a cold since this process was uh, when my friend died and I was crossing to an abyss and 
Um, let you guys continue the conversation. We'll step out for a minute okay. and then come back so that. But uh, yeah, there, I don't you don't know, get like my whole family. And I used to get everything. I used to be sick of it. And I do believe that there is something to the true perception and the um, and, and also you're you're in a field. I mean, when I first started dealing with his materials and the mothers, I give. Full credit. I give probably more credit to the mother in a way because it's more along the line of my own Western, like the ontological reality that I was I was born with. I just was born thinking that we have a soul, even though I was in a fundamentalist Christian uh, childhood. It was a cult, and I was told that you die and you wait for the resurrection to bring your body back. And I'm like, no, you're you come here for experiences and you come back. <laughs> I must have picked you for some reason. <laughs> but so I think that the the true perception is part, and in the field of grace or whatever you want to call it. I would fall asleep when I started picking up these materials to, just to start writing. And they, I would fall asleep, I'd get migraines. It was very difficult to even handle their materials for the first year. It, it's, um, and then I started assimilating. It was, but through tests, it's like, it was like through cosmic tests. Even Ishtar wrote me, she, she said, you know, your journey reminds me of the universe just testing you. <laughs> I get it. That's, you're not that far off. But um, I think that I think that, um, it, that there will be a future. The next, I think there will be a stage. I don't know if it'll be through artificial intelligence or whatever. But I do believe that what he says is that there will be a deathless body. I mean, that's not what I'm focused on. You know, it's also interesting that talking about development, once you posit the soul, yes. then the, uh, reincarnation becomes an aspect of development. Right, exactly. And uh, there also, uh, there is no theory of reincarnation which as, as an aspect of development, with, whether in the West or the East. I would like to work on that. I want to, I mean, I want to paint, but I really want to devote my life to this. It's basically the people who gives it a new metaphysics and a new yes. uh, development. I was born with, with what he and the mother said. I was born knowing what he said. So, so just one small question about uh, just for clarity's sake, you speak about these maps. Um, um, these uh, do they for you uh, equate to entrainment, cultural entrainment, or cultural hypnosis oh, yeah. toward? Um, absorbing a certain a closed system oh, of understanding of our being. Yes. Is that what you're equating to? Oh, I just yeah. oh the, the, the egocentric and the cosmocentric and you know this attempt to kind of stack them together without going to a dimension behind and integrating all three together. I'm not saying the psychocentric should replace the egocentric and the cosmocentric. I'm saying they all should be integrated together. Okay. Okay. And, um, but the one-sidedness yeah, so that's, that's clear. Thank you. Yeah. I just had an observation also as I took down notes. Um, human development seems to follow some universal process or stages or whatever, however you mentally impose your map on it. But there's something, it looks like to the extent that there's biological determinants, there's quite a bit of universality that human DNA has a lot to, to do with it. And then past that, there's social, cultural, um, personality formation and things like that. And then beyond that, we're just in total dark. And uh, we don't know what um, what is, you know, what's going on there. And then there's this other question here, which you brought up, but I'm just putting it together. Then there's this idea of who's the agent, you know, and then there's the soul sort of hiding behind the curtain. So I think uh, just quickly, the, these putting these three or four points together, it will make a simple picture of you know how human development. But but I think that should be written about. If it's a lesson, because there's a tendency for Wilbers or light Wilbers to just stack up as they generate mental formations about things and not really be aware that these are mental formations. Mm -hmm. You know, and they get reinforcement by writing about it and by having other people follow it and so on. But essentially, a lot of these 
so-called what she talked about, stacking of the egocentric development and cosmocentric. So basically, Wilbur says, yeah, you just go through these things and you sort of go into the non-dual places. You know, I mean, he's just inventing the stuff, right? And um, but we should be more responsible in, in, in integral transpersonal psychology. We should really come from experience, you know, to the extent that um, you know we can relate to experience or from experience to the literature or to something beyond that. But but I think you know these are things for us to pause about a little bit and kind of say well, let's not develop too many ideas. Yet there is freedom to create structures, if you like, right? Right. And that's what we get in post-formal development psychology. Everybody's created their own theories and policy structures, so at the same time it's also okay, you know? But if there's really a, a need for genuine understanding, we really need to have that sincerity about our own processes and how much we can really say or should, should say. So I think that's an open field here in, in, in this. Um, Anyway, um, like Carol also said, she touches on so many things that if I was to just open my mind about, I mean, all these interesting things come up. But I think the point here is to make sure that you wrote this dissertation, right? Okay, so thanks, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for coming. <laughs> that was a purpose of the fact that you wrote this dissertation. No, really, it was just to have the pleasure of us meeting each other, all the yeah, people thank that you are for interested. Coming. I really and uh, we just had a brief conference with Matthias and um, from all other communication before and after. I think we can settle on the option that basically says you are Dr. Ticklinski at this oh point. Makes sense any other way, and and I know you worked hard for. You're still. You're probably your inner stuff is still rolling with this till you relax. But um, you know that's really. Um, it was great. Everything was great. The work is great. The presentation is great. It's beautiful, and uh, we just need to wrap up the final copy of the dissertation. That means some other work beyond, and uh, we'll do that. So. Um, we'll sign the proper paperwork for that, so we're, we're passing it with some minor changes to the final document, and um, we'll go Thank from you. here. Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs>